So once again, everyone, I'm Patrice Rankin, uh, Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Richmond. I'm so pleased that you're with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. This is our last webinar in the Two Pandemics series. And although this is the last one, I want to encourage everyone that if you missed any of the previous uh, webinars in the series, you might check our website at as.richmond.edu and take a look at those previous uh, webinars or rewatch some if you're interested. Um, they're, they're there for you. And I just also want to call attention to next year. Uh, we are looking forward to having uh, more of these. We've had series in the past in person, and I'm looking forward to welcoming back alumni, welcoming the general public, and also seeing our faculty, staff, and students in person in the fall. So we are hopeful, and we know that we'll be back and things will be well. Uh, previous guests for this series were city mayors and authors, historians of disease and pandemics, and higher education leaders. I wanna thank them all. And I especially want to thank our faculty moderators, which include tonight, professors uh, Bertrand Ash and Megan Driscoll. And always a thank you to our Office of Alumni and Career Services for helping us with this webinar series. Tonight, we turn to the role of art in understanding the world as it is, but also imagining a world as it might be. In between these two worlds is the work of what I call critical empathy. In the School of Arts and Sciences, we are enriched to have a highly developed site for this work. Our museums and the Modlin Center for Performing Arts, along with our art departments in theater and dance, music, and art and art history. These colleagues and students draw our attention to something we should pay attention to in higher education, beyond critical thinking, and the data and analytical skills that are so important. And that is the work of critical empathy. Empathy is a critical skill that can be taught because it's a habit of mind, not unlike math or chemistry. Detroit artist, Sabrina Nelson, whom we welcome so enthusiastically tonight is such a wonderful example of this work. Her series, Why You Wanna Fly Blackbird, asks us what it might feel like to be someone else, to have their experiences, say for example, that of an African-American mother during these times when young black children are being gunned down in their own neighborhoods. I add to that the critical empathy of what it might feel like to be an Asian American son watching his mother kicked in the street for no reason other than her apparent identity. Yes, we stand in solidarity with our Asian American and Asian Pacific Island kinfolk who are suffering. We condemn the violence directed at these communities. Nelson's work teaches us to listen with our eyes and with our hearts. I want to dedicate tonight's webinar to our outgoing president, Ronald A. Crutcher, who is also an artist and who has taught us a bit about how he listens as a cellist. We listen with our ears and our eyes. And in some respects also, we listen with touch, with our hands. He writes that, quote, we must commit ourselves to listening even when what we hear knocks us off balance. These conversations may not always be easy, but they will be educational, end of quote. Listening is a habit of mind. And I am excited to listen and to see all that Sabrina Nelson has to share with us tonight. Our own professor of English and American studies, Bert Ash, will lead our session. Professor Ash is author of Twisted, My Dreadlock Chronicles, a nonfiction finalist for the Library of Virginia Literary Award. He teaches and writes about African-American literature and culture, including a post-civil rights movement school of art and literature referred to as post-Blackness. He also teaches and writes about the expressive culture triumvirate of Black hair, basketball, not for me, and jazz. He co-authored the 2020 collection of essays titled Slavery and the Post-Black Imagination, and you can pick that up uh -huh. at the University of Washington Press, and his forthcoming essay, American Blackness in Berlin, Race and Nationality in Contemporary Jazz Performance. And this will be published in Sonic Identities at the Margins, which is a Bloomsburg publishing uh, uh, book. I turn my uh, turn things over now to my esteemed colleague, Professor Ash. Thank you for joining us.
Professor Ash, if you if you might. I'm going to give it um, a minute, everyone. It looks like we lost Professor Ash momentarily. Um, we'll see if he is able to return. Okay, well, we don't have Professor Ash, so what I will do is turn things over to uh, Megan Driscoll, who will uh, introduce Professor, uh, sorry, introduce uh, Sabrina Nelson. Uh, professor Driscoll is a incoming, she's brand new professor, uh, finishing up her first year in the Department of Art and Art History. She's an art historian. I'm so pleased that she has joined us and that we have her as part of our community now. Um, uh, professor Driscoll, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Thank you very much. Dean Rankin and technical difficulties, the realities of our Zoom life. So thank you everyone for your patience. I have the honor of introducing our main guest and main star for tonight, Sabrina Nelson, who joins us from her home base in Detroit, where she's practiced as a professional artist for over 36 years, exhibiting her work across the United States and internationally. She works in a variety of mediums and styles, ranging from painting, drawing, and sculpture, to installation, performance, and more, including the often extraordinary costumery with which she turns herself into her canvas. And you were in for a treat for her look today, too. She's also an educator, lecturer, and artivist, using her art as a medium for activism. Nelson has been with the College for Creative Studies, College of Art and Design and Arts Administration for 25 years and with the Detroit Institute of Arts Education Department for 24. She has taught African-American art history at CCS and at Oakland University, served on the Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp faculty, and appeared as guest curator for the Carr Center and the Detroit Music Hall Performing Arts Center. She earned her BFA in Fine Arts from CCS in 1991, and you can learn a lot more about her work in her recent PBS feature focused on her series, Why You Want to Fly Blackbird. Sabrina, if you want to take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, <laughs> I am happy to be here. I want to say thank you first to the college, um, to those who have joined us today, and um, those who uh, have an ear and an eye in listening. Um, about um, why you want to fly Blackbird, or um, just in general, um, how being a being on this planet during uh, the two pandemics uh, can certainly affect what you think your superpower is. Um, uh, my journey is one that is fantastic. And when I say that, I mean just my life in general. Um, Born in 67, I tell people that I was born during the rebellion. So it is part of my destiny to be who I am in this moment in my 54th year. And uh, what that means is uh, rebelling against um, the things that I just feel are not okay. Um, trying to, and I don't always like the word trying, but making sure that I am using my artwork um, to have a conversation about what's happening in the world. And uh, also in being an artivist and thinking about how revolution um, and rebellion can be messy, but also um, needs to be here in this place during this time with uh, what we have and how the world is moving in the way that it's moving. Um, sometimes I wanna be like Fred and Wilma Flintstone where I wanna use my feet as the brakes just to stop it from spinning so fast. Um, but because I cannot do that, I have to be an architect. Um, I have to make uh, myself uh, building and um, the building blocks of change. 
And sometimes that change comes when we stop marching and we start um, thinking about how we can be a combination of a philosopher, a doer, a uh, revolutionary, and also an activist. And so my duty, I believe, is to um, put compassion at the top and put it in a visual way so that I can say, these people, these beings mattered. And how can I get you to understand uh, compassion and feel that? And so hopefully um, some of the things that I'm doing as I walk in the footsteps of people like Grace Lee Boggs, who is a Chinese American activist who lived to be 100 years old and she lived in Detroit, born in 1915 and died in 2015. She would get up and go swimming and you know, talk about change, right? And um, James Baldwin, who I feel like you know, after going to um, the place where he lived, and going to American University and uh, listening to a lot of uh, scholars talk about his path and his journey and uh, what he fought for. And I, I went uh, because I, I know we have several Buford Delaney paintings here in our uh, Detroit Institute of Arts. And I wanted to know who and why James Baldwin and he had such a great connection. And so then I became a uh, a bald winner, if you will, and then also uh, Toni Morrison. And my hope is that uh, the participants who are here will take the time to um, research these names that I've listed and uh, just search what their philosophies of life were and their paths and how they use their uh, craft uh, to think about changing the world, if you will and or what they could say about what's happening in the world. And so any and all forms of art is revolution. And so what you're doing with it and uh, who your audience is. And sometimes your audience is you first and then those closest to you. And you're hoping that you're not just having a conversation that's just in your head that comes out of your hands. And then you put it in a white cube space and somebody sees it. And maybe an art historian or a curator can tell somebody what you were thinking. But if you're lucky enough to be alive in the time that your work is still here, then you can talk about it yourself. And so um, hard conversations, guiding ourselves through uh, this mess, you know, in, in the uh, words of Prince, this thing we call life, um, you know, can be really hard. And so uh, thinking about uh, the two pandemics where it's the racial pandemic and the viral pandemic. I was listening to the news today and Michigan right now at this very moment has the highest numbers of uh, people who have been infected with the coronavirus. And so they're talking about another wave. Um, some people are being vaccinated here in Detroit. They are allowing anyone who is 16 and older to come and get the vaccination. But I am hearing there's still a lot of uh, distrust um, that, you know, is set up in, you know, a lot of black and brown communities uh, with the medical companies. And so, you know, there are people who refuse to get it. And then um, the same thing with uh, police brutality and violence, you know, um, right now I am focused certainly on what's happening with Asian American violence. It, it certainly uh, shakes me. And I think of any uh, group that is a person of color that's being attacked based on their, you know, um, ethnicity is, you know, is just something that is mind boggling to me because we're all going to die. Every single one of us, I tell my children this, uh, my youngest is 20, my oldest is definitely in her 30s. And I say, from the moment we're born, we are dying. What we don't have to do is help death. And so um, no matter what we do, we're going to die. I don't care how many, um, you know, the, the, the creams they have out there for age-defying creams and all of that, it doesn't matter. You can either put the fake up on or not, but you're going to die. But what we don't have to do is help death. And so when I am doing my, um, 
my art's journey and thinking about how uh, bodies are being attacked and they never will get to return to the womb or you know, their communities anymore. That is what I'm thinking of. And my hope is with those pieces, I'm hoping to um, share the idea of collected community and compassion. You know, like how can you watch someone be attacked? How can you not uh, participate in saving or making an attempt? And I know we're all on the path of it, it ain't my business. I don't know this person. I'm not willing to risk. And I'm just, I am not that one. So I am the one who comes from a large family. And um, if I see something that doesn't feel right, it is you know, my duty to make sure that I do everything that I can to help. Um, you know, and knowing that you know, black communities, brown communities are three times higher to die of coronavirus, three times higher um, to definitely be attacked in uh, violence and police brutality. Um, now people who are being attacked uh, because they're Asian um, based on, you know, some of the things that have been said and promoted during this uh, viral infection. It's just my hope that we can see each other as beings on this planet and be compassionate. Um, and I am not only compassionate for you know, the human beings, but also the animals. I, I am vegan, but I'm not a vegan snob. Those of you who eat the butter, go for it. Those of you who still eat steak, I'm cool with y'all. But I just want to make sure that I say that you know, my compassion goes um, on the planet of, you know, um, us being here together and what we can do collectively to help us stay here together for the amount of time that we're supposed to be here, right? Um, and I know there, there uh, were some questions that uh, a couple of our moderators may have had for me. So I want to make sure I answer those questions. I will inject um, some things from James Baldwin and Bracely Boggs and maybe a little bit of Angela Davis and, you know, Sonia Sanchez. These are the, the people that I look up to and also a lot of visual artists like um, Kathy Colwitz or Carrie James Marshall or Faith Ringgold. Um, recently, I just saw a show at the uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, BISA. Um, you know, she did these really beautiful quilted portraits. And with her portrait series was also a soundtrack talking about, you know, um, civil rights, um, just thinking about films and music and uh, poets that write poems like Amira Baraka or Jessica Care Moore, or um, if you know Mums who just died last week, uh, he also was on a, a television series and he did a lot of um, poetry that talked about the world uh, and how we are. Saul Williams talks about the world. And so I am in my you know, renaissance of being an artist and I'm making sure that I understand artists who use their bodies to talk about things or artists who use their uh, creative writing or music. Um, you know, whether it's Curtis Mayfield or Fela Kuti or Sun Ra and knowing all of those folks and why they made the music that they made or Alice Coltrane at the same time. Um, so I am taking in all of those um, pieces to uh, be who I am. So there is a question from Megan. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, hi, Sabrina. Thank you. You're welcome. If you'll forgive me, what will sound like a brief digression, but during the AIDS crisis of the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of debate amongst art, artists, activists, artivists about this tension between mourning and militancy, right? Exhausted okay. grief and the call to fight back. Yes. And your work formally it registers incredibly personally, almost intimately, right? Mm -hmm. It feels like it creates a private space for sorrow and for contemplation between artwork and viewer. But it also cultivates this public space of collective grief. Yes. Calling for this communal mourning outside of the immediate familial bonds. And 
it really registered to me as an intriguing way to address the tension between mourning and militancy that does call for action and that exhaustion and the pain of grief. And I was wondering if you could address this interplay between mourning and activism, either in the collective work of Why You Want to Fly Blackboard or your practice in general, given the moment that we have now with the tension between those two things. Mourning and militancy, wow. Um, <laughs> I think about the idea that, you know, when you're, you're, you're mourning, like there's a sadness. I think about Trayvon Martin's mother, right? There's definitely a sadness that sometimes will drive harder the militancy of, okay, I cannot just lay here. Because sadness can be catatonic if you just sit in it, right? But sometimes it can be fuel for the fight. Like thinking about the rebellion of 67 here, you know, like just the constant, like, hitting and hitting and hitting. And after a while, you just get tired of being hit by all of this, which thinking about, you know, the, the, um, the court case that's going on right now for uh, George Floyd's, Devin, I can't say his last name, but um, Devin or Derek Chauvin, um, you have to think about like, if you don't, if you if you continue to sit in your your mourning and your sadness and you don't fight, it will happen to somebody else. And so, um, for me, I think, just as an example, like knowing that if if you don't fight for those who can't fight, then you know it'll just be a, a mass death, and like. Our bodies fight for us every day to wake up. Like we go to sleep because we're tired. And if you don't take the time to rest, your body's going to take it, right? It's just going to do it. And so we are humans that, that survive. Like we, we eat, we sleep, we breathe. And so I think it is our nature to, um, to fight and to keep going. And I don't know many in my family who just lay down and just stop. And so just as a people, as a group, you know, just like you're constantly being told no and beat down and, you know, all of these things are put in your way to stop you, but you figure out how to get over it or get under it or move around it. And so, um, for me, I just don't know that mourning is enough to stop me. You know, like you can cry, you're gonna get, you're gonna be sad for a moment, but that also will be fuel. Like I think Sabrina Fulton has run for a political office at this time, and that is her fuel to change laws because artists can't change laws. We are not lawmakers, but we use our our pens, our paintbrushes, our film cameras, like thinking about uh, Ava DuVernay to make change or so that people can see collectively what's happening from her point of view so that we can change things. Um, I know uh, Grace Lee Boggs was having a conversation with Angela Davis and it was a couple years before she died and she talked about, you know, we need to stop marching and we need to, to um, feed our souls and figure out how to make change. And so uh, if we continue to march and continue to cry, there's not a lot of things that will change. We have to take action. And so um, I think taking action makes things happen. So that was a great question. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it's sort of beautiful to think about how your work creates the space for the motivation while also making room for that morning. Mm -hmm. And 
I want to connect this then to the first question we have in from our Q&A, and I realize I was remiss in not reminding all of our attendees to go ahead and use the Q&A function. I'm keeping an eye out for them. Okay. Uh, we have someone wondering if you could elaborate, they ask, on the tension between art and protest and how you incorporate or balance this tension in your work. Say that one more time. They were wondering if you could elaborate on the tension between art and protest and how you incorporate or balance this tension in your work. Okay. All right. Um, that's a good question. I am, I get so upset. Uh, and it's so weird that I'm whispering, right? Like I'm in a library, like in a holy space. Um, and I think of museums as sanctuaries because there are so many voices in there of uh, what I call dead masters, right? Um, and some of us are still alive and we get to have a chance to use our voice um, in this way. When I think of Kendrick Lamar and his music or anybody who's using their creative platform to uh, protest that kind of pulls you out of the crowd of people that are in like maybe a Black Lives Matter or a, a women's march for equal pay or even a march for transgenders not to be killed because they're transgender. Like your voice can just be heard on a different platform um, that makes it, um, it takes it out of the silo of your head, right? Because we all have something we think that might be important to say that collectively we can be um, marching together for folks in Ferguson or wherever we feel there needs to, to be a moment. Um, but I think when you have this voice, um, sometimes my visual voice can be louder and have more impact on a much wider range than my physical voice. And so I think of my artwork as a superpower. I feel like, you know, I'm Wonder Woman and I can, you know, fly over really high buildings and go over deep water in it. And what I'm saying is not just here. It can be heard in Zimbabwe. It can be heard in Berlin. It can be heard in Korea. Um, so using that voice and hopefully those that will help you lift that voice, for me, um, is much greater than being on the ground physically with groups of people. And I'm, I'm just better at it in that way. And I, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And so, yeah. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, yeah. It seems like it's not so much attention in your work as the way that you're able to express that. Yeah. So I, I'm really fascinated by the complexity of your practice and all the different media you work in and how elegant you, you bring that together. And I'm curious, you know, your, about your working process or how you decide to work in drawing, installation, how you bring that together, and how that process has been affected by these two pandemics. And just to sort of let you know where I'm going with that after you've explained that, I think I and a lot of the people watching, you know, since this is a school and our students are interested in you know, how you balance that personally and what advice you would give to those students about balancing it. But let's start with your working process and kind of how you bring these complex shows together. Okay. I am definitely um, living uh, as an artist in crisis. Um, this pandemic brings with it uh, PTSD to many people and anxiety and incredible sadness. I lost a parent to um, coronavirus April of this past year. I also um, have had uh, my own son attacked by the police. And uh, I just, it just made me so angry. 
and uh, thinking about like my baby, you know, like that I held in 87 when he came out of my womb and he was my baby and how he could be viewed as threat. Um, just thinking about the idea of how I am able to journal my journey. And how I do that is through my artwork. And how I process what's happening is through the artwork. Also, it's through storytelling. And sometimes with storytelling, it is almost best told sometimes through music or movement or images or pieces. So using uh, performance art, using music, using poetry and writing. Sometimes I'm embroidering words on dresses because the act of you know, doing something that is a very old craft, that is very tactile and piercing into fabric to have a message about and still I rise by Maya Angelou or you know, the most disrespected person is the black woman, which is words by Malcolm X and thinking about what I'm going to do about what bothers me. Sometimes I have to move. And so my conversation and my journaling about my journey is not always easily said in a 2D format. Um, color is not always enough. Making marks is not always enough. Painting on a canvas is not always enough. So I always say in my hashtags that I am the art and the artist. Like walking around on this place that we call earth. Like it's not a performance, it is my life. And sometimes I just have to scream. I have to, you know, respond to what's happening. I'm crying. And sometimes that, that anxiety comes out in a piece that I'm working on. So I have to balance it out that way where I'm, you know, making sure that I'm saying what's in here to get it out in here. And so um, that's how I do it. I, I don't just speak one language of the visual arts. And I think, you know, once you leave uh, a safe nest like an art college, you've been given so many tools and it's up to you to decide which ones you're going to use to say what you want to say. And so for me, I'm not limited to uh, oil paint, acrylic, watercolor. I will use mud. I've used red dirt from Alabama. I've um, looked at things like mysticism and magic and religion and um, talked about life and death and the intersectionality between what it means when we die physically and spiritually and looking at, you know, the spirit of a uh, flash of the spirit, Robert Ferris Thompson's book and thinking about symbolism and uh, what that means in my life, the Yoruba tradition or, you know, any other type of a spiritual tradition of expressing uh, trauma or grief and also joy. You know? So I just don't feel like um, I should limit myself. Um, and I know that like in this country, I feel like our, our educational system should require that our, our kids know like four or five different languages. Um, when you go to art school, you learn how to use different mediums. Why can't you know, that be part of our curriculum to learn different languages. And so um, I just make sure that I'm speaking uh, many different languages through the mediums that I use. So yeah, I'm encouraged and influenced by so many different artists. So I, you know, I don't limit myself to those either. Indeed, you cited some pretty extraordinary people amongst your influences. Thank you for that insight into all the different explorations that you do. 
And we do have a few questions, but at some point you promised that you had some music to associate with each time. So let's make sure we don't miss that. <laughs> but basically, somebody, we have a couple questions. One, someone was asking if you could show some of your works and if you have any available and easy to show, we'd love to see them live. Otherwise we can certainly share links to some of your shows online for people to look at. I would love for you to share the website link because that's all of the most recent work. Um, and then they can, you know, find the videos that definitely follow the Blackbird series. Um, I have, I don't know if I could, I'm scared to touch anything here because I don't have my 20 year old here. Um, hmm, I've got a few things on my desktop. I would, uh, I can definitely, try and get to uh, let's see well and if you'd rather we can absolutely share that link so people i would rather you share the link because i'm scared if i touch something it's not going to be right and i'm not that digital person no problem all right so we'll do that and in the meantime i will share again though not forgetting your promise to share some of that music with us okay all right and I, i'm going to give you guys a sound check list and i'm going to just go down this list and give you some um, I have what I call uh, protest songs for the studio. So I will definitely um, give you those, you know, definitely starting off with Gil Scott Heron, the revolution will not be televised. And if you don't know that, let me tell you, that's a good song. <laughs> that's definitely a good song. Um, no, let's do the other site, sabrinanelsonart.com because the carbon made is, that's much older work, but it's fine too. But definitely the uh, sabrinanelsonart.com is much better. Um, so I have a, um, a list of protest songs that I think about um, when I'm using music to sort of help me travel um, beyond this ground space that I'm in. So I am thinking, uh, we'll start off with... Um, certainly an audio viewpoint. Uh, Curtis Mayfield, uh, definitely, and I have a lot of Curtis Mayfield. I actually buy vinyl, I have a record player. So I have Curtis Mayfield, We the People Who Are Darker Than Blue, one of my favorite songs from 1970, um, Power to the People, another song from Curtis Mayfield. I love Fela Kuti. Um, if you don't know about Fela Kuti, a Nigerian um, artist who is influenced by um, American jazz music, um, any of his songs will work. And I have all of his albums. I'm really good friends with the illustrator who did the album cover for all of uh, Fela Kuti's work. Um, Public Enemy, Fight the Power, that's a 1989 song. Uh, James, James Brown, I'm Black and I'm Proud. I always put that on when I walk in the studio because it's like, you gotta have your walk-in music when you walk in the studio, okay? Um, definitely The Last Poets, um, This Is Madness album. Uh, Donny Hathaway, uh, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. Um, I have so many, um, you know, combination of artists too. Nina Simone, uh, definitely. Um, Black, Why You Want to Fly, Blackbird is one of my favorite songs that I have covered uh, for sure. Um, Talib Kweli, Get By, Billie Holiday, Strange Fruit. Um, I hope you guys have seen the, the new film with uh, Andre Day, uh, Hugh Masekela, Riots, uh, John Coltrane uh, Quartet, um, and any song that Alice Coltrane uh, made as well. She was born in Detroit, so I have a special place for her. Um, there's so many Aretha Franklin songs. Listen, I'm, I'm a Motown girl, so you know I gotta, I gotta throw that out there for, for those of you. Um, I love uh, uh, KRS-One, and there's a few Thelonious Monk songs, Sun Ra songs, and some, you know, recently Beyonce with her Lemonade album and the, the Lion King, there's some songs that I thought were really, really strong there. Um, also, in, in kind of mixing the um, music with the writers, you know, Jessica Kerr, Moore, Saul Williams, Toni Morrison, Sonia Sanchez, uh, uh, Tanahisi Coates, and definitely uh, James Baldwin. These are, are writers that I am highly influenced by their words, um, the way that they lived and are living currently. Um, 
and there's so many dancers. Uh, there's a dancer who was part of the uh, Princeton Harder Fellowship. She was in uh, Jay-Z's uh, video 444, and I can't pronounce her name. It is definitely a Nigerian uh, name, and she is, like, the way that she moves is not, I don't consider it dance. It's, uh, I would say it's definitely performative art movement, where she has a one-woman show, and she is talking about grief and movement and body movements. There's another uh, movement artist named Jennifer Harge as well. And so um, I know this is going to be recorded. So if, if you miss any of these names, they will be here in this recording. So um, these are people who influence me um, with cer certainly um, revolution, uh, movements to help other people, and compassion, and dealing with grief, um, and get up and go-ness. You know, people get up, get ready. You know, there's a train coming, and, and I'm going to be, you know, one of the conductors talking about, come on, let's go, let's do this. You know, so um, <laughs> it'd be interesting to to come up with a term for freedom writers again, you know, and and how we um, think about revolution and uh, the fight for um, just being here <laughs> and being okay, being here and being different, and so. Um, yeah, I wanna, I wanna say that. I did notice that my, my list is very male heavy. So I gotta go back and uh, think about that. By the way, Einstein says imagination is more important than education. So I want you all to um, use your imagination to, um, to journal about what's happening in the world and your journey as you go through it, um, as you deal with our angst, our um, anxiety, with the viral infection that numbers are rising again and do what you can to protect uh, folks who are around you and yourself, you know, um, and be conscious that uh, we're all human beings and we're all going to die, but let's not help. It. So. Thank you. That is very important advice. So two questions that are actually interrelated um, and one that kind of segues from your introduction of writers, um, which is from Professor Elizabeth Outka, who says, hello and lovely to see you. She's asking if you could talk more about the conversation Yard has with Toni Morrison's work through the images of empty nests. And our second questioner, Elizabeth Schlatter, is asked about more about the role and importance of birds, nests, and bird cages in your mm. art. You know, uh, let's start off with the first question. So Toni Morrison, you know, uh, my son, while well, he was at the, uh, he was a Hodder fellow um, two years ago and he got to live on campus, uh, it was actually a year and a half ago. He got to live on campus. While he was there, I visited several times and I was able to visit uh, the Toni Morrison um, student housing and some of the places that she actually taught in. And just thinking about a lot of the interviews that I heard her give, my son had an art exhibit called um, The Work of a Lifetime. And he was talking about the blue collar workers that were there on the campus and how um, all of the portraits in the halls of the schools and the portraits that had been there for years were of white males. And so he decided with his fellowship to paint portraits of the blue collar workers that were there on the campus, those that kept the sports fields, those that cooked in the canteen, those that uh, cleaned the spaces, um, the facility workers. And so that became this big thing. But in, as he was working on that, I was just listening to a lot of Toni Morrison's uh, lectures and her voice is like, it was very similar to, and I don't mean the physical sound, but the way hearing her voice made me feel was similar to um, Maya Angelou. It's something very calming and melodic and maternal. It's like I could listen to her for hours. And there was something she said in uh, one of her interviews. Um, when there are times that are really, really tough, um, these are the times that we need to pick up our pens and we need to write. 
And so I took that as a charge, like, you know, in this time where it's really, really hard uh, for me, after my father died, after watching the constant deaths, and, and I don't even have a television, it comes through the computer, it comes through my phones, it comes through my iPad, um, that were um, happening uh, and that were being uh, broadcast through all these social medias. Um, you know, a part of me wanted to freeze and not move, but listening to Toni Morrison in her most beautiful voice saying, these are the times that we need to continue to create. Uh, it just made sense to me in those moments, like that's the best time to make art. Um, and so just reading her books, uh, Sula and listening to her interviews, uh, it just made sense and something clicked and a light went on. And I, you know, around that time, my father was in a nursing home and he, you know, they told me he had coronavirus, that it was, his uh, test was positive on a Friday. Um, he had no symptoms, so the hospital wouldn't take him. So they couldn't take him out of the nursing home. Tuesday, he died. And so I was like, he didn't have a temperature. He was still eating. And then, you know, in the, in the midst of him dying, there were also all of these police brutality um, things that were happening. And I had so much sadness. And, you know, when you get the ugly cry, it's like you're not like an adult anymore. And you're like, oh. And then you get exhausted by crying. And then you get this, there's this energy that comes after it that you get angry and you need to do something. And for me, that was like, I need to write what I'm thankful for. I need to be in the light. I need to bathe myself in flowers and treat myself as if I am the patient and carry myself with white gloves and be my own nurse at that moment and think about what I'm listening to, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, what I'm smelling. So I started to medicate myself with art books, with music, with taking, ordering flowers or having people bring me flowers and maybe three or four days after they were in the house, cutting them and putting them in the tub and be becoming, you know, my practice and my performance and my medicine at the same time. And just thinking about, you know, what um, James Baldwin went through when Medgar Evans and Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King were killed, he was incredibly sad and he actually uh, tried to commit suicide, it wasn't his time. Um, eventually cancer took his life. But just thinking about how artists are incredibly sensitive and they have to figure out a way to get through whatever that, that holds them still. And for me, uh, moving and dancing and having music and, and being able to talk again with my artwork was that way. And I think Toni Morrison did that for me for sure. So I think I answered that question. I think yeah. I <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, that's an incredibly powerful moment of inspiration. And I'm sorry that you went through that with your father. It's, you know, it's, it's just a part of life that so many of us are going through. I mean, you know, with all of the deaths that are happening with coronavirus right now, it's going to be, you know how they say there's six degrees of separation. It's going to eventually be, you know, one out of 10 of us will know somebody who has had or who has died from this uh, viral infection if the numbers keep going the way that they are. So, you know, it's, um, it's really sad here in Detroit uh, for sure. And then in Michigan, we are, we are certainly the highest numbers right now today, to this date today of people who are infected with the viral infection. So, um, we are not burying our people in the tradition that we normally would. You know, people are having online Zoom memorials. They are not going to funeral homes. So for some people, they don't have the closure that they need, um, but we'll, we'll figure it out. We have to thrive and create through it and um, 
figure out how to um, stay connected to each other and faith and um, you know, have some vision for what we wanna do the next day or figuring out what we're thankful for in that moment. You know, I think it's Rumi that says, if we live in the uh, past, we're depressed. If we live in the future, we're anxious. If we live in the moment, we are at peace. Yeah. Well, to this sense of this experience through the pandemic, the second part of Elizabeth Auka's question was how you feel the sense of empty space within images of empty nests resonates visually with the current pandemics, which might link to the general importance of birds' nests and bird cages in your work? I, I just feel like the world is so loud right now. Um, it's incredibly busy. And because it's so loud and busy and we're connecting um, through these platforms, uh, this blue light that we have glowing in our face at night uh, is different than the blue light of the sky. And if we're, we're living so much in here where it's so busy, we don't have or take a moment to have the, the real beauty of being out in this space where sometimes, um, even though the world is really, really crazy, you just don't hear it when you just go outside and shut down these things. When I am doing my work and when I am visiting museums, I think of them as sacred spaces, sanctuaries, if you will, because they're quiet and there are not as many people in them anymore. Um, I think with my work, there is a quiet, or I would say a loud whisper, if you will, because I give you enough space at looking at the idea of the emptiness, the idea of the empty womb and the bird cages, which sometimes can be looked at as homes or jail cells. Sometimes the physical body is no longer there and the spirit is free and sometimes the physical body should not be there. Um, I think having space to um, just absorb something mentally and through your heart um, gives you enough time to uh, not consume it, but to let it just kind of soak in, if you would for a moment, um, you know, just like thinking about medicine, like being very intentional with what you look at and what you listen to and what you eat and what you smell um, and feeding the senses those things that can either lead to a pathway of healing or give you some deeper understanding of what could be possible or what has happened. Um, the idea of all of those spaces, me with doing the Blackbird series, where you don't hear the noise of those birds, like imagine this world without the birds, right? Imagine this world without Black and Asian or people of color. And so um, my work is silent that you see in those spaces because I can't imagine a world without those beings. And so um, thinking about space, thinking about absence, thinking about trauma and grievance is all connected <laughs> with those two pandemics. Um, I don't believe in the word forever. I don't believe in the word perfection. Um, but I also am thinking like, what are you gonna do about it? Like, what else can be done? Have you said enough? Are people really understanding what you're saying? Did you give them enough space in between the pieces that you've created for them to absorb it the way you felt it should have been absorbed? And um, do, are people listening? You know, like, like 
I always hear that, you know, you're preaching to the choir, you're preaching to the church. Um, those that will hear will hear. And, and those that won't, maybe somebody else has a message from another canon that maybe they can hear. So I hope I answered the question. Speak, speaking of preaching to the choir, this so far has been such food for my soul. And I, I hope for those that are out there that they're feeling the same way. This has just been so far just wonderful. I say so far just because I'm jumping in to let everyone know. Normally we try to wrap up around eight o'clock. We're coming on the hour of eight. But um, if there are other questions and we want to hang out a little bit longer, uh, I, I think um, uh, Sabrina Nelson is willing to do so and uh, Megan Driscoll is willing to do so. I just want to thank uh, Megan Driscoll one more time um, for stepping in with the technical difficulties we had with Bert Ash. Megan uh, Driscoll is assistant professor in modern and contemporary art. And as I mentioned earlier, she's come to us recently. She is uh, coming to us from Washington, DC, where she was a postdoctoral research associate at the Center for Advanced Study in Visual Arts. Her research explores the intersection between post-war photographic and time-based media and discourses on race in the African diaspora. And so she was ideal for us as someone we wanted to help facilitate the question and answer, which she has done a lovely job uh, of, do, of, of, of as well. Uh, Bert for post-Blackness and all the work he does. I don't know if he wants to jump in at all, if he's got a question or just wants to, if he has the opportunity to wave and say hi, if not, that's fine. But I just wanted to let everyone know, we'll uh, wrap up officially. We'll ask one or two more questions. And if you do wanna hang out, um, we can hang out. Here's Bert raising his hand. Looks like he wants to jump in. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> You're like, maybe no, I just not. Wanted to, uh, testing one, two, three. My mic check. My mic I wanted to mic check one. <laughs> yeah. I, okay. I, I, I'll, I'll hand it back. I'll hand it back to Megan. No worries. I'll hand it back to Megan. Thank you. And, and Sabrina Nelson, thank you so much. Again, food for our souls. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to dinner <laughs> and then allowing me to, to, um, to have this medicinal food to, um, to give out. I, I do wanna say um, to any uh, potential students who are on here, um, if you stay anchored in your, um, or connected to your learning, uh, it just will make uh, the world clearer as you go through it. You know, you'll be able to um, make choices that uh, can help you and whoever's around you. Um, stay anchored in, in, in your learning and in your faith and um, stay connected to your community. Um, call and check on people that maybe you haven't. Um, go visit uh, art shows if you can see them in um, spaces that are not too crowded. Uh, certainly go and visit um, sanctuaries and look at some of the, the great masters works that are no longer here. And if you have an opportunity, those who are here, reach out to them and ask questions. Um, if you can, um, it will allow you an opportunity to um, see the world beyond um, what you see here, but maybe through somebody else's language. And so I hope um, you've enjoyed this talk, uh, this exchange. And if you need to, I'm always on the other side of this computer. You can reach out to me through my uh, website as well. There's always something happening, and you know, and in my heart, uh, I hope uh, that there is a change that is going to come. You know, the world is going to be different when we get through this uh, this one pandemic. And in some ways, um, the world is always changing, but in this country, there's very much that is still the same, and we have to. Um, charge the youth to uh, help us make those changes because um, you guys will have the power and so um, and the voices and you will be able to move in ways that some of us will no longer be able to move so my charge to you is if things are not different uh, in some time um, what can you do to make that change and I charge you to make it for the better for your future and those that will come after you. 
Thank you. And I have to use that opportunity, encouraging students to see art and to think about making change to plug the, one of the big shows. It's actually at the University of Richmond's museum now, Action Reaction, Art of Social Justice, featuring a really, yeah, a really extraordinary range of artists, including recent graduates and artists working for you are now, Miles Wilson and Sandy Williams. So please go see that show and get inspired to make your own art of social change. And one of the fabulous curators had, um, was wondering if you could speak more about the general role of bird cages in your work. They do play such a prominent place, especially in where you want to fly blackbird. So definitely the, the bird cages represent, um, uh, so in one of the flying dresses, the bird cage is placed in the area where the womb is. So they represent the first home, which is the womb. And then uh, the nest represent the second home, if you will. And then the bird cages outside of the, the dresses represent our homes physically. Like we assume that when we go in our homes, we are safe. When we go in our homes, we have uh, our things that make us comfortable. And so um, I started thinking about bird cages and an installation of, of like bird cages, because thinking about Detroit neighborhoods and as I travel all over the country and then out of the country and thinking about how people live and how people nest and what we do and how similar it is to um, the, the idea of, you know, like birds don't build bird cages, people do, because we think all animals should live like us, right? Um, but thinking about the bird cage in the physical form and uh, different stories, like, you know, why the cage bird doesn't fly or thinking about how many people are, of color are incarcerated. Um, and what, what that means, you know, and how they live in those spaces. Um, in most of my installations with the bird cages, if you can zoom in, all of the cages, the doors are open. Um, so that you are free to come in, you are free to go out. The spirit of the bird is also free to enter and to exit at will. And so as we are in our homes, um, our hope is that we are safe in those spaces, um, that they're comfortable and we put the things in there that we want that make us comfortable. So uh, that's how the bird cages came about. Um, and then I liked the way that they looked aesthetically once I sprayed them black and then I put uh, gold leaf on them. Um, and then a few of them, I left white um, thinking about uh, the women in my family and uh, uh, my grandmother, my great grandmother and my mother who are all deceased and thinking about um, what spiritual uh, connection that um, the way that they set up our home when I was little um, looked like, you know, it had all these, these things and I grew up in the 70s. So, you know, we had the Kennedy's picture in the house and Dr. Martin Luther King, there was always like the last supper. We even had a white Jesus in the house. We had a black Jesus. And then you have all these shadow boxes with little things that they collected as they traveled um, between Detroit and Alabama or even out of the country. And so um, these were things that I remember growing up that a lot of the people in my neighborhood had. And so the idea of what home is, what a bird cage is to people and um, how we nest um, that is very similar and also very different. And what it's like to have a space that is prepared for someone who never will return to that space. Um, you know, once you have a family member who is killed or who dies and you go back to that space and they, their things are still there, their smells, the way that that, that space exists with that person in it and without that person. And so I, I was thinking a lot about that when I created um, the installation with the uh, bird cages. And so my goal is to have them in a, uh, 
a medical facility uh, above the heads of people um, who walk there, but having them and thinking about um, all of those birds who will never get to return home. Um, so, you know, that's a, a thought later. We have so many hospitals here, um, but not to think about uh, the sorrow of it, but, you know, freeing of the soul and also not being in those cages the way that we are physically anymore as a space. Empty spaces, empty nests. So yeah, and empty bird cages. I hope that answered the question. It, it absolutely did. Um, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, thank you again, Professor Megan Driscoll. Uh, once again, everyone, uh, www.sabrinanelsonart.com. SabrinaNelsonArt.com. Please take a look at that work. It's um, not only stunning visually, but it's thought provoking uh, as, as we see with, uh, with Sabrina Nelson tonight. Uh, thank you again. Everyone uh, be safe, be well, uh, spread your wings uh, to use that metaphor again. And uh, yes, um, do your thing, young people. Thanks again, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.